Hello, I'm Simon Bradshaw. I'm one of the directors of the Australian Tibet Council, and I'm here with Tenzin Norbu, head of the Environment and Development Desk of the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, we've been very lucky to have Norbu with us here in Australia for a few days. He's been very busy. He's had a very hectic schedule in Canberra, talking to a lot of Australian politicians. He's met with the Tibetan communities, uh, done public talks in Melbourne, been at the Brisbane Festival of Tibet, and he's about to give another public talk in Sydney in just a few moments. Uh, now, Norbu, your talk this evening is called Climate Change on the Tibetan Plateau and its Global Significance. So I thought the first thing I'd ask you is just why is Tibet and the Tibetan Plateau so important to global discussions on climate change? Uh, the first thing I would like to stress is uh, the Tibetan Plateau, as uh, the most of people regard. The first thing, maybe five years back, or maybe ten years back, the Tibetan Plateau is considered as the roof of the world. Now the things have changed a little bit. Since now we have the global warming issues and the climate change issues, now the scientists have been referring the Tibetan Plateau as the third pole. So beside the two poles, Tibetan Plateau as the third pole, because the whole plateau is very prone to uh, the landscape degradations, and we have the glaciers melting. So everything that's happening around on the Tibetan Plateau that has been happening as we speak is something that really concerns not only the six million Tibetans but also uh, the billions of people who are dependent on, especially, for example, on the water resources that mm. it takes. And the other thing, uh, the very important thing, the role that Tibetan Plateau plays is it also acts as uh, the barometer of Asia. Mm. So as we all know that a lot of, uh, millions of people are dependent on the Southeast Asian monsoon cycle. So Tibetan Plateau, in a way, it acts as a heat pump. So when the plateau is warmer, or when the plateau gets more heated, especially in the summer, at some point it delays or you cannot, it disturbs the cycle of the monsoon. So Tibetan Plateau is very important as the water tower of Asia, as the Chinese themselves have recognized it as the number one water tower of China. Mm. So I think at this point, the Tibetan Plateau is something that uh, we cannot neglect, mm. not only to the six million Tibetans, but to billions of the other peoples who are really dependent on the health of the Tibetan Plateau. Mm. So that's why I think it's Tibetan Plateau is you know, the environmental changes that are happening on the Tibetan Plateau is something that everybody should be concerned. And uh, we know that the Tibetan nomads are an important part of this story. Um, could you tell us a little about, I guess, the role of uh, Tibetan nomads in protecting the Tibetan environment in the past and how nomads are faring these days under Chinese policy in Tibet? Yes, uh, the Tibetan nomads, or I would like to refer as the pastoral nomads, so these nomads have been very successfully living on these the pastoral lands, which accounts for approximately 75% of the whole the landmass, the Tibetan Plateau landmass, for thousands of years. And some researchers had it saying that the pastoral nomadism dates back to more than 8,000 years on the Tibetan Plateau. And since then, they have been living very successfully on this plateau. Now, uh, the new Chinese policies, in a way, it's more like killing two birds with one stone. So first, they get to remove all the nomads from the pastoral grounds mm -hmm. on the basis that uh, they are saying the new policy says that the nomads has been or the livestock is responsible for overgrazing and degrading the grasslands. Mm -hmm. On the other side, it's easy for the Chinese uh, or the party, the Communist Party, to control the nomads because the nomads, they have been very mobile throughout the whole region because they never stick to one place. They move with their livestock from, say, a summer pasture to autumn pasture to winter pasture. Mm. And through this, at some point, uh, the nomadism as a such on the Tibetan Plateau is more like a, a survival strategy. So in order to survive and live successfully on the Tibetan Plateau, which is uh, the elevation, this could be average 4,500 meters above the sea level. And at times you can get very extreme winter temperatures. So at this time, the best way to survive is you have to be like the Tibetan nomads. So at this point, these days, the Chinese policy, uh, the new policy or the grassland law policy, in a way, it can be used in very different terms. Sometimes they are saying, Tumai Hum Chao, which says to abandon, to abandon the livestock, to restore the grasslands. So this policy, which uh, is implemented in a way of... Uh, saying a new countryside project or countryside settlement which has removed or displaced the nomads. Up to now, since 2006, 
they have removed approximately 1.3 million nomads in these settlements. And this is uh, the China media themselves admit that. Mm. And they are saying by 2013 they are planning to remove almost uh, the entire nomads from the plateau. So which is very, you know, which is very worrying and very issue that should be raised. Mm. Now, normally we know that you and other Tibetans have been very active in the uh, international climate uh, scene, most importantly at the uh, UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen in 2009. Um, what has been your experience there? Do you find you've been able to communicate these very important concerns where it matters? Yeah, uh, that's right, because whenever we have this uh, UN Climate Summit, or especially any uh, international conference, especially related to environment and climate change, during the summit, we have come across uh, very strong NGOs who really share our concern. But at the end of the day, everything remains on those policy makers and decision makers to decide. So what I've felt so far is uh, whenever we have this climate change summit, for example, we participated in the Copenhagen and uh, we did our lobbying at our best and we were able to uh, create a lot of awareness, especially about the Tibetan Plateau and its environmental significance and the nomads, the problem, the nomads they have been facing. But uh, on one side, when it comes to making any climate deal, I think uh, you are sure about that. Most of the countries, they are more concerned about the trading partners. Mm. So when it comes to business, when they talk in terms of business and climate, so they are mixing business and climate, So which in any case uh, I don't think is correct as an environmentalist. So I don't think uh, we should put the business aside and first try to resolve the climate issue and the environment issue first. Sure. Because we are sharing this one earth, so everybody is responsible for a very healthy earth. Mm. So I think uh, in future, in any climate summit, uh, the policy makers and decision makers should first think as a human being who shares the earth equally as other human beings, not as in terms of how much profit he or she or his country can gain. Mm. Very wise words, thank you. Um, now speaking of decision makers and policy makers, I know you briefed a number of uh, politicians in Parliament House yesterday. What sort of things are you asking uh, that Australia do to uh, better support the situation in Tibet? Yes, uh, I do understand that uh, Australia on one side and the China on the other side, they have their own business terms and conditions. And uh, similarly, like India also, we've been getting a lot of support from India. But when it comes to business, China is the number one Indian business partner. The same thing goes to Australia also. China is number one Australian business partner. Mm -hmm. But from the Chinese side, that's not the case. But what I'm happy is so far what I've learned is there are many projects, especially not focused particularly on Tibet, but on the third nations, developing nations. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy that uh, there have been some research ongoing projects that are actually helping the grassroots levels and especially financed by ACR. So I'm happy to just uh, admit in front of the parliamentarians that uh, I'm thankful for such projects and in future I do hope such projects will continue so that uh, these projects as a result uh, or maybe as a spin-off from these projects might be able to you know give some a very strong signal and message to those policy makers who are sitting in Beijing and just passing out the policies without actually having known what's actually happening on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's about time we let you get to your next talk, but uh, look, thank you very much for coming to Australia. It's been very educational for all of us. I think we've all learned a lot from uh, listening to you speak over the last few days.